Member Cantwell, members of the committee, it's an honor to be here. Um, after hearing Mike Gold's testimony, I, I, wanna, I wanna comment on a few things in my five minutes. Number one, everything he said about medicine and microgravity is correct. We are seeing transformational capabilities in pharmaceuticals because atoms and molecules organize differently in microgravity than they do here on Earth. There are drugs that we are demonstrating on the Inter International Space Station that we can create that can do things like, you know, we had a, we had a drug, a Merck drug, Keytruda, which is for lung cancer, um, and we were able to, to make that drug so that instead of, instead of trying to find out if within two or three months if it's gonna be efficacious, you can find out within two to three weeks whether or not it's gonna be efficacious. Instead of administering it with an infusion, which takes time and is painful and um, is, is costly, you can do it with a pill. These are transfer, and that's just one drug that is improved. We're talking about drugs to treat diseases that have never been treatable before. To piggyback on what Mike Gold just said, we are either gonna have that capability in the United States because we have a permanent human presence in space with a fully mission-capable space station, or we're gonna cede that to China. It is really that simple. Now that's just on the pharmaceutical side. Then we also talk about regenerative medicine where we're actually 3D printing tissue. Mike mentioned the meniscus where we're growing in 3D tissue like cardiovascular tissue and vein tissue and other things. This type of regenerative medicine is critical to the future economy of the United States of America. And if we want to not have a fully mission capable system, if we want to not have a, a permanent human presence in space, then not only does that capability go to China, but all of our international partners go to China as well because they want that capability. This is a big deal. Um, so that's on, on the low Earth orbit side of things. And Senator Cruz, I wanna, I know you're getting a lot of accolades today, but it is absolutely true. The one big beautiful bill with the 10 billion additional dollars for NASA human space flight was in large part you're doing, and I know it was bipartisan. I know the one big beautiful bill might not have been bipartisan, but that element was in fact bipartisan. And I know senators on both sides of the aisle are grateful for your leadership on that. So very important. I would also say the purpose of this hearing is, you know, are we gonna be able to get to the moon first? I mean, that's, that's the title of the hearing. And I will tell you, and I'm, I know there's gonna be questions and I'll go in, into more depth later, but look at the architecture that we have developed to land human astro or American astronauts on the moon. Look at the architecture. It is extraordinarily complex. In some cases, you know, it, 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 it hinges on us, me saying here today that it is highly unlikely that we will land on the moon before China. And I'm gonna explain it in the next two minutes. <laughs> so number one, we have the SLS rocket, which is the most powerful rocket ever built. And Senator Cruz mentioned, yes, it has had its problems in the past. It has been expensive. It had, it had overruns, all those things. But it's behind us. It's done. We need to use it. We have the Orion crew capsule, which quite frankly is a, a shiny object in this whole thing. The Orion crew capsule is not only usable today, but uh, ultimately the cost is going down because more and more of it is reusable every time we use the Orion crew capsule. Those two elements are, are in good shape. I will tell you, I have been critical of both in the past in front of this committee and other places, and I'm more than happy to be critical of all of our contractors, just to be really clear. But I will say what we don't have today, here's what we don't have today. We don't have a landing system for the moon. And there was a moment in time when we had no NASA administrator. It was after I was gone and before Senator Nelson become, became the NASA administrator and architecture was selected. And I don't know how this happens, but the biggest decision in the history of NASA, at least since I've been paying attention, the biggest decision happened in the absence of a NASA administrator, and that decision was, instead of buying a moon lander, we're gonna buy a, a big rocket. And I wanna be clear, we need this rocket to be successful, it's important for the country and it's transformational. But in the meantime, the architecture is as such. We need to launch Starship. That first Starship is a fueling depot that's in orbit around the Earth. Then we need to launch, nobody really knows, Nobody knows, but it could be up to dozens of additional starships to refuel the first starship. So imagine launching starship 
over and 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 over, dozens of times, no delays, no explosions, to refuel the first starship. Then once it's fully refueled, then that starship has to fuel another starship that is in fact human rated, which that process hasn't even started yet. By the way, that whole in-space refueling thing has never been tested either. We're talking about cryogenic liquid oxygen, cryogenic liquid methane being transferred in space, never been done before, and we're gonna do it dozens of times, and then we're gonna have a human rated starship that is refueled that goes all the way to the moon. Now when it goes to the moon, we don't know how long it can be there because it's boiling off the entire time it's in orbit around the moon. We don't know how long it can be there, but while it's there, we have to launch the SLS, we have to launch the Orion, the European service module, we have to have astronauts and crew all ready to go. And they have to, they have to orbit the moon themselves in that window, that window when Starship is around the moon, and then they have to dock around the moon, they have to transfer from the Orion into the Starship, it has to go down and land. When it's on the surface of the moon, Starship is gone, or uh, Orion is gone for the next seven days until it comes back around in near rectilinear halo orbit. So our astronauts are right now planning to be on the surface of the moon for a period of seven days without any way home. This is an architecture that no NASA administrator that I'm aware of would have selected had they had the choice. But it was a decision that was made in the absence of a NASA administrator in the last administration. It's a problem, it needs to be solved, and that puts us as a nation at risk of not being the first on the moon. I should say the first next on the moon because we did land in 1969 to 1972. And Chairman Cruz, I would like to compliment you. I've heard that you, you have said that we need to put it into law that The Wrath of Khan is in fact the greatest Star Trek movie in history. And we are in, in agreement with that. So with that, I yield back the time that I took from the general. I thank the administrator. I will say I'm not sure we need to codify the Wrath of Khan any more than we need to codify gravity or that the, the sky is blue. There are some things that are indisputably true and that would be one of them. General Shaw. Right, uh, Chairman Cruz, or do I say Captain Cruz? Uh, Ranking Member Cantwell and members of the committee, thanks for the opportunity today. And by the way, I'm also grateful to share the table with some amazing people here and, and look forward to our session and what they have to say today. Uh, it was the honor and time of my life to serve our great nation and lead our phenomenal warfighters for 33 years in uniform in our United States Air Force and United States Space Force. Throughout my military service, I also had the privilege to work closely with NASA, NOAA, and other governmental civil organizations across many endeavors. But I'm also grateful to have had the opportunity the last two years since my departure from uniform service to work with and in the commercial side of our nation's space business. It's given me a fresh and broader perspective on how to both envision and realize our nation's future in space in totality and how to bring to bear our combined national strengths to best thwart China in the years to come in this crucial arena. My bottom line up front for the committee today is that I am an advocate for and a champion of a unified grand space strategy for our nation, for the Earth Moon system and beyond. Yet such a grand strategy, which would unify and synergize our national efforts across civil, commercial, and national security activities in pursuit of common goals, opportunities, and capabilities, does not currently exist. And I believe our mission to return Americans to the moon can be a powerful and a central driver, as well as a beneficiary of such a strategy. During my military career, I watched and studied, as any good soldier would of a potential adversary, as China slowly but surely developed and deployed its own civilian and military space capabilities and set its own agenda for space achievements. It is clear to me that the Chinese Communist Party is already employing its own integrated grand strategy for the Earth-Moon system, with only superficial distinction between civil, commercial, and national security activities, and all focused on a common purpose. And as uh, uh, the Senator has already my, made my next point, I, don't think if, I think if we don't unify and synchronize efforts, we may find ourselves, rather than a leadership position, in a position of, of increasing disadvantage as we get further into this century. Human progression in any domain both has and will involve a robust mixture of exploration, economic opportunities and growth, and security activities to set conditions for success. Space is no different. And by the way, I realize I'm probably representing of those three things, exploration and commercial and economic growth and national security. I'm representing the national security end here, but I also want to say I am passionate and excited about all three of those things. And that's how we're going to succeed as a nation. 
A notional example for a grand space strategy, example objective, would be to set the condition standards and proper incentives for the establishment of an orbital and lunar logistics infrastructure, one that would enable increased capabilities and performance for space activities of all kinds throughout the Earth-Moon system. Such an infrastructure would include on-orbit manufacturing, assembly, refueling, replenishment, and other forms of servicing. We already know that we will need such an infrastructure to sustain human presence on the moon solely from just the exploration approach. But such an infrastructure could also and will benefit dynamic space operations for national security platforms as well as for commercial endeavors. Yet our national approach to space logistics to date has appeared disjointed and inconsistent to those in the commercial community, and I hope my panelists maybe, maybe address this and see their perspective, is seen as inconsistent to those who might want to invest in those capabilities. The Chinese are already matching and perhaps even outpacing us in this logistics pursuit. Here's a recent example. Just in the last few weeks, this summer, as observed by open sources and reported in media, we have seen China perform a docking and apparent refueling operation between its SJ-21 and SJ-25 platforms in geosynchronous orbit. Following that fuel transfer activity, the docked spacecraft together, this was, uh, in, this was just last month, performed the largest single maneuver in geosynchronous orbit ever yet conducted, likely in excess of 330 meters per second. That's a lot, actually. Well, at least by today's standards. Some days, someday that will be a pittance, but today it's, that's a lot. Other examples of area where I believe we can move faster and more effectively under a unified strategy includes his lunar space domain awareness and a cis lunar communications architecture. Both, again, necessary for sustained human presence on the moon. I'm also supportive of swiftly developing nuclear fusion power solutions in space, which are compelling to sustain operations on the lunar surface, but could also better enable national security activities, such as in the form of nuclear propulsion, and could unlock new commercial opportunities and benefits as well. I will point out that China is developing or has already fielded capabilities in each of these example areas. This is lunar domain awareness, this is lunar communications, and space nuclear power. The challenges are great, the matter is urgent, but I'm optimistic we can indeed, via a unified grand strategy for space, thwart China's ambitions and continue the United States leadership in this ultimate high ground. In the words of a different Star Trek captain, let's engage and make it so. I look forward to your questions. Thank you to, e to each of you. Uh, Mr. Bridenstine, let's start with China, a topic you addressed at some considerable length. China is on an aggressive timeline to put astronauts on the lunar surface by 2030, and it, they appear on track to do so. They're also currently operating a space station right now in low Earth orbit. Mr. Bridenstine, China is racing to control the moon and low Earth orbit, and they're not shy about using space to expand their power on Earth. If America doesn't beat them, if we cede the lunar surface or continuous presence in orbit to Beijing, what does that mean for our national security, our economy, and America's leadership? Uh, very important question. Um, so here's how I, here's how I view things, um, and I think the general will appreciate this from my time as a lieutenant in the, in the Navy. Uh, we did joint professional military education, and we learned this thing called the DIME theory of national power. And in each of those elements, you have, you know, it's, a, it's an acronym, DIME, Diplomatic Information Military Economic Power. When I was at the helm of NASA, my goal was to always think about what we're doing in those elements. How does this advance diplomatic power? How does it advance information power, military power, and economic power? On the diplomatic side, you mentioned the International Space Station and the next generation commercial space stations. On, on the diplomatic side, we, we have um, like 15 different countries that are operating the International Space Station today. We've had astronauts from, I think, 21 different countries at this point. We've had agreements with over, over, actively, I think we've got over 600 or 700 agreements now internationally as it relates to, to missions. NASA is a key element of diplomatic power for this country. I will tell you, I don't think it's often used correctly. I mean, we could put it on the table for a whole host of, you know, kind of carrot and stick kind of activities to benefit the United States of America and an America first policy. That's the way I thought about it when I was the NASA administrator. On the information power side of things, you know, one of my big things that I had, one of my first eye-opening experiences at NASA, um, 
you know, when, when we landed InSight on Mars, this was a lander that was gonna land on Mars and help us understand Mars quakes. Like how does Mars, how is it organized inside? Well, when we landed InSight on Mars, it was on the cover of every newspaper worldwide. That's amazing information power, including one newspaper was the, um, it, was the, it was the hardline newspaper of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran. Now, I'm not saying we want to win their press, but at the end of the day, it was a story about how we landed on Mars. But their Sunday comics are excellent. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was a story about how we landed on Mars, and, and it was a story about how we did it, when we did it, what we were doing, and it had a list at the end, the last or, was all of our international partners that participated with us in that. This is a newspaper in Iran where they don't get good information about the United States of America, but when we land on Mars, it changes things. It changes the perception of young people towards this country that we love. And I think that's an important power, information power. Of course, everybody likes to talk, you know, Apollo 11 when we landed on the moon and the whole world watched. I mean, that's information power that we reference even today. You know, if, if, we can, if, if we can land on the moon, why can't we do these things? You know, that kind of thing. Um, on the military side, NASA is not strong. We, are, we don't play military. We don't report to the Secretary of Defense. But a lot of our technologies and capabilities, in fact, have dual use capability. One thing that concerns me greatly right now is the devastating consequences happening to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in California, JPL. They're the ones that build all the, the Mars landers. They're the ones that have landed on Mars nine times in history. But a lot of that technology, make no mistake, has military application, and, and, and we're, we're, we're at risk of losing a lot of that. So I think that's important to note as well. Finally, uh, that's, um, that's the military side of things, but it's really not where NASA plays. NASA plays in exploration science discovery. The E, and this goes back to the opening statements, the E is economic power. When it comes to pharmaceuticals, regenerative medicines, advanced materials, article came out, China is using their space station to create new advanced materials for hypersonics, materials that my understanding is we don't have right now, although maybe somebody knows something I don't know. At the end of the day, we have to use microgravity where we know atoms and molecules organize differently. We have to use it to our advantage and advanced materials. China is doing that, um, and, and we're not doing it the way we should, and we're at risk of losing it. So all of those elements, I think, are important when we think about the great power competition with China. We need to think about NASA being used for diplomatic power, information power, military power, and economic power. Thank you.